back. Let's get us started. It's a few minutes after eight here. And uh, I will begin with kind of looking at the syllabus for a second. Um, because we are coming to the end here of chapter four. And so just kind of remind you of where we were when we left off. We'd be talking about the, the structure of chapter four, the, the kinematics. And what if you had constant acceleration? And I'll begin by putting that all on the board in just a second. But I wanted to remind you that I started chapter four with the idea that it was following behind chapter three. And chapter three was learning how to do uh, those vectors, those I hats and J hats. And I was trying to point out that that mathematical skill was an important skill to develop because we need it for our two-dimensional motion. And so I think you begin to see that when we were doing our discussion here with, with chapter four. And you'll really see it today when we get into some examples. And so that's where I want to begin with, you know, just kind of the examples. And encourage you too. I know that many of you are finishing up chapter three and that's great. <coughs> I want to encourage you to get into chapter four and do as much as you can, as soon as you can on chapter four. Because as I said last time, and we'll continue to say, chapter four puts everything together. There'll be some parts of chapter four where they'll ask you to do some unit conversion, maybe miles per hour into meters per second or whatever the conversion is. Well, that was a lot of the things we learned in chapter one. Also, two-dimensional motion is a overall arching compared to the one-dimensional motion of chapter two. Or put another way, chapter two is a subset of chapter four. So again, if you know how to do chapter four, you can probably also do chapter two. That's why we learned chapter two first and why I kept emphasizing on Wednesday that the way to handle this two-dimensional motion is to do one-dimensional motion twice. And you'll see that both in the math because you'll have the I hats and the J hat. And you'll see that in our discussions today as we do some of those. And so that's what chapter three gave us. So again, chapter four puts everything together and it puts us in a really good position to get ready for our first exam. And so that's where we're, we're headed. And so when today's over, we will, I guess, be ready for the first exam, not to say it's coming up because um, if there wasn't a holiday next Monday, that would be the ideal time to have the first test. Uh, since there is, it's a week following it. So I th if you haven't looked at the syllabus, make that note that uh, we're going to wrap up these chapter four. We're going to get into chapter five. But our test really isn't for two more weeks, two more Monday because of the holiday on the Monday. Is the chapter four homework due this Wednesday or next Wednesday? Then? So next Wednesday, <laughs> yeah. Next, uh, as you pointing out, Monday is a is a holiday. So yeah, take the take the weekend to do it. This is like I said, the real one that to test yourself. We'll get started in chapter five, of course, on uh, Wednesday. That's actually kind of my fear when I was making up the uh, syllabus. I said, oh no, if we don't have the first test until that late, I wonder how many people will listen to me when I start talking about chapter five. But I, I think you guys will I'll encourage you to because it puts a little bit of strain on the second test. The second test then comes pretty quickly. Um, but again, making the syllabus, and I'm glad I did it this way, I was realizing that there would be probably a lot of people in class, and it is, and uh, because of that, I want to use that second room down there, overflow room, and so a lot of you will be in here, but some of you can be down there, and that'll just give us a little bit of room to spread out. The only thing is we only have that available on Monday. So in case you forgot when I said it on the first day, that's why I put all the tests on a Monday so that we can use that, what I'll call the overflow room, which, like I said, is not available on, on Wednesdays. So, so that's, again, why we are not having the test next week. Wednesday, or even this Wednesday. I wouldn't have had it this Wednesday. That would have been too much turnaround to talk about chapter four and then give you the test on Wednesday. But I would have liked that Monday, and then that Wednesday, would, and just because of the classroom situation, I bumped it one more, yeah. Is the chapter five homework gonna be due on the same day? Um, let me say no to that so you guys can focus on the, on the test. But I would encourage you to be working on it because my concern is, and I want to str uh, stress with you guys, that as soon as we take that test, if you haven't really done anything for chapter five, you're going to be starting with the idea, you know, that, hey, I'm behind because right after the test, I'm going to go into chapter six 
and then you're going to be playing catch up and that test number two is going to hit you real hard so no i'm not i'm not worried so much about having the, you know the homework due um, but i am worried that if you don't do enough you know or plan your schedule the second test will hit you hard that's why i'm bringing it up yeah so that being said then let me put on the board uh, what we learned here in chapter four and really it's the same thing that we learned in chapter two and I keep saying it that way with the idea that will that will help you with your learning that there is a connection between the position and the velocity uh, we take the derivative the only thing we added here in chapter four compared with chapter two was that we had two-dimensional motion meaning that we had velocity in the x direction and velocity in the y direction at the same time and to indicate that we put little arrowhead meaning over our quantities but the connection between position velocity acceleration and time are all related with that mathematics and so, although I said it jokingly, it was really quite serious that here is the answer to all the homework problems for chapter 4, which chapter 4 is all the answers to chapters 1, 2, and 3, and hence this becomes the answer to everything we've done so far in class this semester. And so, as you sit down and work at the problems, this is going to be it. Uh, I'll point out then that we took the special case and said what if you had constant acceleration and we came up with an equation that related velocity acceleration and time we called it equation number one and what we saw when we left is we would have two equations one for the x and one for the y and that's what we got when we started with a constant acceleration and we integrated it once then we integrated it a second time and so we went right through this little chart that gave us velocity and so now we would have position and we came up with this mathematical equation which again was the same one we saw in chapter two it's the same math same idea hopefully not a surprise the only thing that we really added here on wednesday was that there would be subscripts either x or y going with whatever we're talking about the position on the x-axis or the position on the y-axis realizing that a moving object would do both at the same time so i think it will serve us well then to jump into your book here and spend the day doing examples and i've got five listed for what we'll call projectile motion and another four that are listed for circular motion and at this point we haven't really mentioned anything about circular motion but I will but I want to do these five now here to get us started so again I think one of the best ways to learn is just by watching and then next by doing and so you'll watch me and then you'll do the homework here um, let's see I think we're getting some pretty good numbers at about 145 percent or something like that um, and so let's come back here a couple pages I think I what number did I put there 15 yeah and so let's read these here's 15 it looks like it starts on the bottom of one page and goes over to the next but number 15 I thought would be the kind of the easiest one to do first here and so let's look at it here it says a ball is tossed from an upper story window of a building the ball is given an initial velocity of 8 meters per second and an angle that is 20 degrees below the horizon or horizontal it strikes the ground three seconds later okay and then it starts to ask a bunch of questions but for me I'm gonna go ahead and draw a picture from that let's see I'm gonna put the ground here and I'm gonna put a tall building uh, maybe I'll make a little opening here in the building that'll be the the window 
All right, so that's the, the first part of this. A ball is tossed from the upper story window of a building. It's given an initial velocity of eight meters per second. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and draw a little dotted line to represent a horizontal line and then kind of put a vector here saying eight meters per second. I'll even put a little angle 20 degrees below. Okay, and so that's that first part of that. Eight meters per second, 20 degrees below. And it does say it lands three seconds later. Maybe I had to draw the, the whole picture. So here's kind of the ball. It starts off and it angles down, something like that. So time equals three seconds. All right, so I know it's gonna hit the ground three seconds later. Uh, then there's a bunch of questions that they want you to kind of reason through here. A. How far horizontally from the base of the building does the ball strike the ground? All right, so there's our first question. So the first question is really this distance. Oh, well, let me call it X, because again, like any problem, We've got a connection, but we've got to be reading our mathematics. What do we want to understand? And what do we want the symbols to represent? And like any of these problems, I would ask you, where do you want to put the origin? I mean, sometimes they set it up that they are picking the origin, uh, but they didn't this time. So I should ask you guys, should we put zero, zero where it's tossed? The corner of the building, where it lands, okay, based on your head nod, I'll go with this one. Looks like most of you said that one. And of course, let me emphasize, it doesn't matter which one you pick. What does matter is you make sure that you recognize <laughs> that you're making a choice, you are picking it, and that you go with that choice from here out for the rest of the rest of the problem unless you want to modify it in some way and of course then you have to justify how and why you can can modify it but the point is again it's that freedom of choice but once chosen it has power over you and you need to stick to that for the the rest of the problem all right so I will pick that as the starting point and I suspect most of you were shaking your head because that's what your author does I think almost every problem he does he picks the launch point to be the origin in fact I will encourage you to take that approach in the lab today uh, to la today's lab is a two-dimensional motion problem and you are going to as you see when you get into the lab we have this little ball launcher uh, you launch it two times. First time you launch it horizontally, and the next time you launch it uh, up at an angle. But either case, I would suggest at both times, why don't we pick the origin to be our starting point? See, one of the advantages of that is when we start to ask ourselves with this problem, is this a constant acceleration problem? Okay, yeah, it is. So that means these, pro these equations down here I could use. And of course, one big idea here is what would you say about the initial position X and initial position Y? There's zero. And so it's nice to have equations or terms in an equation that go to zero. And so that X equation right away gets simplified by picking that to be our origin. And I should go even further. What is the acceleration in the x direction? Zero. Zero. Again, good. We did that from Wednesday. And so this equation for getting the ball in the horizontal direction has been significantly reduced. Two of the three are, are zero. Uh, let's keep going with this. What about velocity in the x direction? How would you do that one? Okay, good. A lot of you are seeing it right away. Uh, it's not 8, is it? See, 8 is the total speed. That's the polar coordinates we were talking about in Chapter 3. That's the speed of the ball down at an angle. And so if I was making a little triangle out of this and said, well, that 
would represent a horizontal speed and a vertical speed. V8 is the hypotenuse of that right triangle. And I want a component of it. I want the component that is adjacent to the 20 degrees. Well, adjacent is cosine, as I heard a number of you saying. So here's magnitude and here's component. And I suppose direction would be positive x direction. And I'm not even going to put an i hat in here since this equation has already been separated out from the i hat. So notice we don't have the i hat, but, but the whole position was this part had an i hat and this part had a j hat. And so I've only wrote this part of it, the i hat. <coughs> but that would be the x direction. Okay? And then, of course, the time, and maybe I should put 8 meters per second, because then it's 3 seconds. And so that's enough information to answer this first part. How far in the x direction uh, did it go? And so 8 times cosine of 20 degrees times 3 comes out to be about a 22.6 meters. So there's A, how far from the base. And so, again, and hopefully this one is straightforward enough that you saw it without question, but you're reading the math. When they ask how far from the base, they're telling you find x. It would probably be easier if they said find x. Uh, but they don't, and they will never will. They'll, they'll, they'll ask it in a verbal way so that you'll have to connect the words to the equation. B, uh, it says find the height at which the ball was thrown. Well, again, height. Uh, sounds to me like they're asking something about the vertical components. So let's come over here. And again, you've already answered this question. It is a constant acceleration problem, so I could apply this. And so I will write down that equation. But one of the first things I'll do is I will go ahead and say, what is the initial position of this ball? Yeah, and by picking the launch point to be the origin, we've picked that to be a zero. Now, a consequence of that is then that this ball goes down, we're going to have negative numbers for the final position of the ball. Now, again, not a surprise. If you, if you pick zero to be the highest point, then everything else is negative numbers. Fine. You might say that maybe that would be one of the advantages for those of you who shook your head when you said, do you want me to pick this to be the origin? Because in that case, you're picking the lowest point to be the origin, and then we would have only positive numbers. Of course, we wouldn't know how high it launched from. That would be the negative part. But then again, on the other hand, what we would know is we would know where it landed. We would la know it landed at a position of, of zero. So, of course, both of them work, and that, you know, should make sense. But it's just that choice of how you want to pick that. Anyways, I'm trying to say it, I'm picking that initial point to be zero. Uh, and let me keep going here. I'm going to then find the value of y. Where did the ball land? And I would say, what's the initial velocity then in the y direction? And maybe I'll ask the same thing. Is it 8? No. It's, what do I need with the 8? Don't I need sine of 20 degrees? Right, good. And one other thing, it's down. So what do I need? Negative, right? So magnitude component and then the direction. And hopefully the direction you see here in this picture, that this ball as it is being launched in a downward, forward direction has a positive speed in terms of its x motion, but has a negative speed in terms of its vertical motion. Okay? And so same idea, magnitude component direction goes here magnitude component and direction. And so that is the initial velocity in the y direction. And of course the three seconds is the time. 
And now we're back to a question that we dealt with on Wednesday. What is the acceleration in the y direction? Yeah, good. Negative 9.8 meters per second. And so that's what we meant by having a constant acceleration. We wouldn't be using these equations if we didn't have constant acceleration, but also as we use them we need to know both of those numbers and we need to know that they are constant. And what I was trying to convey here is this y is the 9.8 that we've been using with just like we did back in chapter 2 and it's zero in the horizontal direction. We know both of those. Of course then I can also put the three seconds and square that and now I can plug and chug here and get the answer. But again, knowing what each of those symbols mean and reading them uh, is a big step because once you get that, then it really becomes just math at that point. You plug in the numbers, you get out the calculator, you solve it. Um, so eight or negative eight times the sine of 20 times three minus a half times 9.8 times 3 squared. All of that gives me a negative 52.3. And so that's where the ball lands. Downward, there's the negative, 52.3. And that might be good enough, although I do think when you read it here and they say find the height of the ball, I think they're looking for a measurement that would be positive from the ground up. So I suppose the answer height might be 52.3 meters because, of course, measuring upward there is kind of implied. But, like I said, it's, it's not that crucial. I don't think the author is being real clear that you would have to give a positive number, but usually that's what we do for a height, a, a positive number. So I'm going to put the answer as a positive number, 52.3, noting that, again, what I discovered is where the ball lands. And the negative doesn't surprise me because the ball landed below where it got started. That's my, my point. And then, I think there was a C to this one, wasn't there? Yeah. C, how long does it take for the ball to reach a point that is 10 meters below the level that it is launched? All right. Well, I'm going to give myself a little more room here and come clear this out and put C over here. Say, all right, let's look at C. Now, C's asking for time. And they're asking for time when it's 10 meters below the level that it's launched. Well, again, I put all those together in my mind, and I'm thinking, that sounds again like this equation number two, a perfect recipe for it. One involving distances and times and acceleration. Uh, and so I will write it as y equals initial velocity in the y times time plus one half a y t squared. Well, that'll be my first step. Now notice in that first step, again, I was already substituting in what is the initial position. Okay, so again, we, I'm using the same as before here. I haven't changed my origin in any, any way. I'm saying, okay, what is that initial value. And so as I begin to fill these in, what things maybe are different than B, what I've erased, Well, I guess that is still the same, right? That is how much speed does it have initially in the y direction, magnitude, component, direction. Question? Say the final height is zero. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay, hang on with that question here. Let me, I just wanted to stay focused on this one, but all right, I'll come back to that one. But what about time? Is that three seconds? 
Right, that's going to be the variable. That's what we don't know. In it. And, and again, didn't sound like that was hard for you guys, but that's the point I'm getting at when I keep saying read the math. What does each term mean to you? And of course, the time it means, um, as the name implies, the time, you know, how much time evolved from the point you launched it. And of course, the three seconds was how much time it took to hit the ground. This then would be a different amount of time. It would be a time that is 10 meters below. So it is not the three. That's the unknown in this problem. Okay. And so filling in the other ones, this would be a plus one half. This is still the negative 9.8. And then there's that same variable time. And so those are the ones I don't know is the time. That's what I'm looking for. I know the acceleration. I know the initial speed. And then now let's get to your question. What about this side of the equation? Do I know the, the final point? And is it zero? Is it ten? It's negative ten. Exactly. And so, sounds like there's no fooling you guys. Maybe we should have the test Wednesday here. You guys are already ready for it. No? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's exactly it. They say ten below. Notice they didn't say minus, right? And they didn't tell you where it could be a 10 because you had that choice. You could have picked the origin down here and then of course your starting point would have not been a zero. Your starting point would have been the 52.3 and your ending point would have been the 42.3. So there's a lot of ways of doing this problem. But they did say 10 meters below. And so how you set it up, this may or may not be a 10 and this may or may not be a negative. But the way we set it up, it is definitely a negative 10. And so now, of course, I have one equation with one unknown, although it's quadratic. I've got to do a little bit of work here. I'm going to take this one and move it to the other side so that the negative 4.9 becomes a positive 4.9. I'm going to get out my calculator and just find out what is 8 times the sine of 20. And uh, when I move it to the other side of the equation, it comes out to be a positive 2.74t. I'll leave the negative 10 on that side, and so now I've got a quadratic equation written in the standard form that you learned in back in your algebra class so that you can then solve this for time. And just like we saw in chapter 2, there would be two options. Both of them have a physical meaning, only one a realistic physical meaning for this problem. We can interpret the other one. Uh, the other one, uh, no surprise, would be if this is the movement of the ball, if it had a constant acceleration for all negative and all positive times, that would be the whole motion. At this spot, it doesn't surprise me that it crosses that spot twice. This is time equals to zero, so there must be a moment in time slightly greater than zero, and there must be a moment in time quite a bit less than zero, and so I would expect to get two answers, and of course the one I want is the one just slightly greater than zero. But less than three seconds, obviously, because I do know it hits the ground at three seconds. And so the one that's between zero and three is the one I'm going to grab. The other one should be a negative number. Uh, so I've got the opposite of B. Then I've got uh, B squared minus four times A times C. All of that over... 2a. Let me do all that square root stuff first. 2.74 squared. A minus and a minus make a plus. So let me put plus 4 times 4.9 times 10. Let me take the square root of all of that. And that's about a 1427. So I guess the negative one I'll do first, but that's not the one I want here. Um, I've got a negative 2.74 and I'll subtract the 14.27 take all that and divide it by that comes out to be 9.8 and that's a negative 1.73 seconds yep sure enough there's that negative one the one I don't want the other one starting with a 
negative 2.74 and adding to it 1427. And divide that by 9.8. Gives me a 1.17 seconds. Ah, I thought it was going to come out to be a number less than that. Anybody else do it? Yeah? You got the same number? Good. All right. So I was just looking for some confirmation. I th thought it might be a little less than that. Too. I guess not. If I just dropped it free fall, one second it would fall five meters. Uh, this already has a downward speed. So maybe that's about right. But I know three seconds later it hits the, the ground and it's got to go 52 meters. So I was thinking a little bit less, but it, it'll go pretty fast by then. Anyways, I, I am hoping you see the, the numbers there. And that's a good first one to, to begin with. Uh, let me go to another one here. How about 56? I think 56 is kind of a, a step up, if you will. Um, it's got some added features. One of the biggest one is it brings me to one of my favorite cartoons when I was a child. So it brings back memories here. All right, so let's look at 56 here. It says, the determined coyote is out once more in pursuit of that elusive roadrunner. You've seen these, haven't you? You're not, okay. They, they still show them, don't they? All right. And here, the coyote wears a pair of Acme jet-powered roller skates that provides a constant horizontal acceleration of 15 meters per second. The coyote starts at rest 70 meters from the brink of a cliff at the instant the roadrunner zips past in the direction of the cliff. Now assuming the roadrunner moves with a constant speed, determine the minimum speed it must have to reach the cliff before the coyote. And then at the edge of the cliff, the roadrunner escapes by making a sudden turn while the coyote continues in a straight, con coyote continues straight ahead. And so if you've seen the cartoon, right, here's the idea. And here's the timing of the Roadrunner. The Roadrunner, of course, as the coyote is, well, I guess the coyote is at rest. So the Roadrunner goes by, and as he goes by, then the coyote is going to turn on that jet-powered skates and eventually start catching the Roadrunner. And of course, the clever trick of the Roadrunner is to say, I'm going to get right to the edge, and then I'm going to turn. And I'm going to go such a fast turn, and you can't make that turn that you go off the edge. It's, I guess, a common procedure. I know these cartoons aren't real, but in the real world, that's a lot like the, I guess, the uh, cheetah chasing the antelope, you know. It's got to be a scary situation for the antelope, but if the antelope times it well, they'll be running along at, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 miles an hour, but they've got a cheetah bearing down on them at 80 miles an hour. You know you're not going to outrun it, but the idea is you time it just right. So what happens when the cheetah gets close? You make the, the quick turn here. And so at least the smart antelope, don't, don't move. Keep running. Run straight. It's, I guess, no different than a fighter pilot, which has got to be another scary situation. You're flying along. Somebody shoots a missile at you. Don't turn. <laughs> you got four seconds before it hits you. If you turn, the missile's just going to turn and follow you. So what do you do? You just wait. <laughs> and you wait. And you wait. And if your timing's right, you move at the last minute and the missile can't turn that quick and then it, it misses you all together. So you get the idea. And I guess I got sidetracked from the problem. But the idea here is that our timing is crucial. And what we're going to do is set it up here so that we've got two objects moving. One, of course, is the Roadrunner one, and the other one is the Coyote. And we want to get this timing just right so that essentially the two of them get to the brink of the cliff at the same time so that the movement of the Roadrunner actually does some good. It actually makes it a fake. If Roadrunner to turns too early, the coyote's going to notice it and, and turn with it. So drawing a picture here, what number is this? 56. And so putting a little diagram up here, 
Um, I know that the Roadrunner is racing along. Hmm. What does a Roadrunner look like? Okay, don't laugh. Um, road. Uh, I guess it has a body, legs, neck, beak. <laughs> Yeah, it looks a lot like an ostrich, huh? Okay, so here's this roadrunner coming along. And the coyote, oh no, coyote. I um, guess it's got a nose and a snout. Uh, I'm going to draw Snoopy, how's that? <laughs> Yeah, here we go. All right, so here's a, this coyote. All right, so I'll put RR here for Roadrunner. I'll put COY for Coyote. But the idea here is this Roadrunner is moving along with some speed, and maybe I'll call it speed V sub RR for Roadrunner. So the Roadrunner is going to keep going along this same speed. And we are told then that it's 70 meters off to the edge of the, of the cliff. And I think they said the coyote is just sitting there and waiting, right? Is that once more pursuit? Coyote, yeah, starts from rest, 70 meters from the brink of the cliff at the instant the roadrunner passes by. And so you notice this in chapter two, that some of these problems can get kind of tricky when you have your two objects. And the real key is organization here, thinking through what does each symbol mean for which object. And so we've got two objects here. I suppose the one thing that's going to make it fairly simple here at the beginning is that I would say so far this is only one dimensional motion. This is really a chapter two problem. We don't get to two dimensional motion until the coyote goes off the edge of the cliff and begins to, to fall. And in that case then we lose the road runner. So we don't have two objects each with two dimensional motion. Um, We'll get to some of those harder ones soon, but at least here we just have a one-dimensional motion and it's only X, and, but we've got the, the two objects. And they were nice in one sense, is that we are going to start the clock when they're at the same place. So they have the same initial position and at the same initial time. So as you, if you remember from the chapter two, uh, that makes our problem a lot easier to deal with in terms of structure and keeping track of our, our clock, if you will. But there's this whole idea. So if I were to write out the motion of the roadrunner, I would start by saying, is this a constant acceleration problem for the roadrunner? Yeah. yeah. In fact, it's a pretty easy one. What is the acceleration of the roadrunner? Zero, right? And so if I were to write out that first equation for the motion of the road runner, I guess the first thing I would have to decide here is where am I going to call the origin? Where do I want to put x equals to zero? Yeah, yeah and I heard a number of you, you say it and totally agree. Why don't we put right here where the coyote is at rest and where the roadrunner then zips past and everything kind of starts at that point. Let's call that our x equals to zero. So not only is that the time equals to zero, that's going to be my x equals to, to zero. Which I guess if I call time equals to zero, that also has to be my x equals to zero. Um, but or it has to be the initial position. Whether it's the origin or not depends on where I put the origin. But that would make that one a, a zero. And also, thinking about the roadrunner, what's the acceleration in the x direction for the roadrunner? That's zero too, right? Because I said the roadrunner is moving with a constant speed, right? And so it always has that same speed. It's not increasing or decreasing. So I'm going to put velocity RR for the roadrunner and put T there because whatever that initial speed of the roadrunner has keeps the same thing for this whole distance out to the edge of the cliff. So there would be my equation for the roadrunner. 
And really the only thing I know in this problem is that the Roadrunner is going to go 70 meters. I don't know how fast the Roadrunner is going, nor do I know how much time it is going to take for the Roadrunner to get to that 70 meter mark. Oh, but I do know that it's 70 meters. And so that by itself means I have two unknowns but only one equation, so I can't solve that. Keeping that in mind, that's my clue to go on to writing down the motion for the coyote. For the coyote, I will say x equals, and then go through this same idea. The horizontal motion, again, let's call the initial position for the coyote zero. What's the initial velocity for the coyote? Zero. They so made that really clear. It starts from rest. And so maybe in your notes, I'll just put zero plus zero, right? It's zero position and it's a zero initial velocity. But they also made it very clear that these rockets are going to give the coyote some acceleration. And I think they said 15, if I remember right, in the reading here. Yeah, it gives it a constant horizontal acceleration of 15 meters per second each second. So this would be one half times 15 multiplied by time squared. And so that would be my description for the coyote. And this one's nice because I know that the coyote, at least to get to the edge of the cliff, would go 70 meters. And so there's only one unknown in this equation, and so I can solve that fairly simple. How much time does it take for the coyote to get to the edge of the cliff? And it looks like it's 70 divided by 7.5, and then the square root of all of that gives a hair over 3 seconds. 3.05 seconds. And so there's the time frame for the coyote to get there. And of course, coming back then to the road runner, is we would want the road runner to get right to that edge roughly at the same time. Maybe a hair less, but let's just see what the speed would have to be for the road runner to get there exactly at the same time. And then we can argue that the road runner's speed should probably be a, just a hair above that. And so if I put in the 70 meters and I put VRR and I put a time of 305 seconds, I will get what I will call the minimum speed for that road runner as 70 divided by 3.05 coming with a 20, well it rounds to 23.0 meters per second. So, I guess we want the Roadrunner's speed to just be just a, just a hair above that. Actually, I ended up rounding up, so that's probably good. It came out to be 22.95, and it kind of depends on significant figures here, whether or not this is actually a rounding up or, or not. But that's the idea that they're after. This would be A, what is the speed of the Roadrunner in order to get there. All right, well, again, keep trying these here. Um, let's see. Now, at the edge of the cliff, the roadrunner escapes by making a sudden turn, while the coyote continues straight ahead. The coyote's skates remain horizontal and continue to operate while the coyote is in flight, so that the acceleration is still, see that? 15 meters per second in the horizontal direction. So we're trying to make it very clear that even though now the coyote has got to this edge over here, <laughs> that now as the coyote flies through the air, it is going to drop, and they say right here, there's the acceleration, 9.8 meters per second downward, yeah, but the jets on the, the uh, these roller skates keep operating. 
which of course totally messes up the cartoon because that's not how it happens in the cartoon. I mean, it, you know you only fall once you look down. I mean, that's really what would happen in the cartoon. But nonetheless, I don't think that would be as interesting mathematics. So they, they, they left the rocket on here and then left the acceleration due to, due to gravity. Which then gives us to B that says, okay, so if the cliff is 100 meters above a flat floor of the canyon, determine where the coyote lands. Alright, so maybe I should have put an A here to say, okay, that's the first question. B then is saying, well, where does the coyote land? And the new information here is that this cliff is 100 meters, the canyon floor is flat, and that the acceleration in the x direction continues to be 15, and the acceleration in the y direction is our standard negative 9.8 because of gravity, and now we've entered into a two-dimensional two motion problem. And so I would say, all right, we don't have to worry anymore about the roadrunner's motion. Let's just look at the coyote. However, then the coyote has an x and y motion. Is this a constant acceleration problem? Yes. You say yes. I'm not disagreeing. But I am going to ask this. What was the acceleration of the coyote before we got to the edge of the cliff? It's 15 in the x direction. What was it in the y direction? Zero. Now, after the edge of the cliff, what is the acceleration of the coyote? Right, the y direction has changed, hasn't it? The y direction is now a negative 9.8. All right, so I'm going to ask again. Is this a constant acceleration problem? In pieces it is, right? In fact, I would, I would say that the first piece we've already done right here was a constant acceleration of zero in the y direction and 15 in the horizontal. So I can continue to use these equations, although here brings up an important question. Where do you want to put the origin? Yeah, and I would suggest we change it at this point. We know this much, <clears throat> that because it's not a constant acceleration from the very beginning to the very end, because the vertical one does change, right? The vertical one is zero for here, and then negative 9.8 later. There is no way I would try to apply my equations from the very beginning to the very end. Now, I can do it piecemeal, right? And that's what we saw a lot in chapter 2, where we said, look, the first half of it has a constant acceleration, and the second half of it has another constant acceleration. And so the ending point of the first half becomes the beginning for the second half. Remember doing problems like that? And I'm really doing the same thing, except now it's two-dimensional motion instead of one-dimensional motion. And so I'm going to suggest that whatever we just figured out for the first half, the ending speed, the ending position, all of those things become now the beginning point here. Which then begs the question, do you want to change the origin? Yes. I would say yes. I'll write down the first equation and say x equals to x initial plus initial velocity in the x plus one half acceleration in the x direction t squared. That would be the equation that we've argued is valid if you have constant acceleration and you are telling me we do have constant acceleration in the x direction. And so I'm going to use that equation, but when I go to use that equation, what I need to ask myself is what are you calling the beginning? What is the initial position as you are using this acceleration that is 15 and negative 9.8? Doesn't it have to be here? Now that doesn't mean you have to move the origin and call it there. You could say that your initial position is 70 meters away. That's fine. Or you can move the origin. And looking at your guys' faces, some of you are suggesting I start with a new origin where it's being launched. And others of you are saying, no, let's, let's stick to the old one. 
And I would say that they're equal, but I would say I need to make a conscious decision on what I am doing so I don't mix them up. And since it looked like more of you said to move the origin than to leave it where it is, I will do that. And so let's start this part B by referenc referencing our zero position a little bit differently. Again, doesn't have to be that way. I was just kind of looking for your reaction, what you would like to do. I, I will say, if you look at the question, the question says... Determine where the coyote lands in the canyon. So I think what the problem is really asking for is this distance anyways. So because of that, I would say that gives me a strong reason why I would move my origin to here. And I would start measuring everything from this point forward to figure out where the coyote lands. Again, not to say I have to do it that way. But to point out, I need to be reading and understanding the math and the equations and the symbols that go along in here. Yeah. So if you uh, said it started from 70, you wouldn't change the final distance at all? Uh, no. For example, let's say that I don't move the origin and I do a calculation and find out that the coyote lands over here 170 meters. That means this distance is 100. Oh. If I move my origin and put it here, I'm going to get that the coyote lands at 100. Either way, the distance from here to here is going to be 100. It's just how do I represent 100? I can say that's 70 to 170, or I can say it's 0 to 100. Either way, it's 100 meters. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, like I said, since most of you were shaking your head about moving the origin to that, and since they are asking me to measure the distance from here, let me go ahead and do that. And I just want to make that really clear as you read your notes. I also want to make it really clear, you don't have to do it that way. It's a choice. But you've got to make that choice. You've got to understand what you're doing as you are laying out a particular problem. What is the mathematics? So doing that, that's why I'm going to put zero for the initial position here of the coyote in part B and not put a 70. Now, whether we moved our origin or not, we know we have to have the... Oh, I'm missing a T here, aren't I? Sorry about that. Whether we move the origin or not, we do know that the initial speed <coughs> has to be the speed when the coyote is launched from here. Be well, I guess we can get away with it in the x direction, because actually the acceleration in the x direction didn't change. Uh, but there is a change in acceleration in the y direction. And so I, I do need to make sure the ending speed of part one becomes the beginning speed for part two. Uh, but I just noticed for the x direction, I don't have to be that critical about it. Uh, but I'm going to anyways. I'm going to say my initial speed is whatever <coughs> speed the coyote had at that point, which I had did not, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I did not calculate it here in A, but I could have. So let me do that now. I will put the initial speed and acceleration and time. The initial speed is zero. The acceleration, as we already mentioned, is 15. The time is 3.05. And 3 times 15 is what, 45? And a 75, can I just put an 8 there? And so 45.8 meters per second should be the speed of this coyote when it gets to the edge of the cliff here. And so knowing that, I will put that right here. Here is the 45.8 meters per second. And it looks like I didn't quite give myself much room in this chart. Let me just put a T. Let me put a one half, let me put a 15, and let me put a t squared. And so this would be the equation for the coyote. I would like to know how far does it land. So this would need to be the time it takes to land in the canyon floor. Right? But of course, that is one equation, but two unknowns. I don't know how much time it took 
to land on the canyon floor, and I also don't know how far it went. I do know if I knew how much time, I could then get how far. But I'll stop in terms of the horizontal motion. Let's look at the vertical motion. And so if I write out that same equation, let's see if this can help me at all. And I think it can. And by the way, this will be the lesson in the lab today. You are going to be then using the vertical motion as a clock. And I don't know if you caught that, but isn't time related to vertical position? And as you'll see here in a second, this will give us enough information. If we know vertical distance change, we can get time. And then once we know time, we can jump back over to here to get horizontal position. And that's what I wanted you to see. And that's what I want you to see when we do the lab today. When you fire your cannonball in class today, you're going to want to calculate how far it goes. But to do that, you need to know much time. Both of those you don't know at the beginning. However, you do know, because you're going to measure how high the cannonball starts, you can measure the Y. And then from the Y, you can get the time. And from the time, you can put it over to here to get where it's going to land. And if everything works well in the lab today, you're going to take your little cannonball launcher, and you're going to calculate where it lands, and you're going to put a little target out there, and you're going to shoot it and hit the target. Uh, that's the idea of what will happen in the lab. We'll see what happens in the lab and see how many of you hit the target. But that's this same idea. So watch this here. When it comes over to here, I could say, all right, the coyote starts at an initial position of zero. What's the initial velocity in the y direction of the coyote? Yeah, zero. And so again, coming back to part one, we see that the coyote is going very, very fast in the x direction, but it's not going up or down in the, in the vertical direction. And then we have an acceleration of a negative 9.8, and then there's the time squared. So there's the unknown time, and look at the other side. Don't we know the final position when the coyote lands? What is it? Yeah, it's a negative 100. Don't forget the minus sign here. It's going down, but it is negative 100. And so looking at this equation, I should be able then to solve for time. And that's what I meant earlier in that phrase, that hopefully you see it now and you also see it in the lab, that we can use vertical motion as a clock. If we know something about the vertical motion, we can get the time. That can be helpful because now we can put time into the horizontal motion and get the range. How far did it go? And so in my case, I will have a negative there and a negative there, which I'll drop off. I will have a 100 times a 2 divided by 9.8, and then the square root of all of that gives about 4.52 seconds. And so that's how long the coyote is flying across the canyon there. And then again, that's helpful because when I come back over here to the horizontal motion, I can put that number into this equation. So I will go 45, oops, oops, hang on here, let me, I think I messed up there. Okay, yeah, 45.8 times 4.52. Add to that 1 half times 15 times 4.52 squared. And so I get 360 meters. And so there's how far the coyote lands. And obviously a long distance. And going back to your question, had I left the origin there, that number would have been, you know, 70 on, on top of that, 430. But either way, we would have agreed that it moves across the canyon floor 360 meters. Now, not done here. There's a part C to this. It says here, determine the components 
of the coyote's impact velocity. All right. So again, there are the x and y motion going on. And maybe I'll come over here and do that x first. Velocity in the x direction is equal to initial velocity in the x plus acceleration in the x multiplied by time. So as we argued already, the velocity initial is already 45.8 meters per second. And so that's the speed the coyote gained during the what we call the part A of the problem. But of course now we're going to keep gaining a horizontal speed. That was only three seconds. This is four and a half seconds. So 4.52 seconds. And so this would be the speed of the coyote. Uh, 45.8 added to that 15 times 4.52 and I get a speed of 114 meters per second in the x direction. And in the y direction, I would have initial velocity in the y, um, I should put y, plus acceleration in the y multiplied by time. And as we argued, I'll say it again, in the y direction has no speed for the coyote. The coyote just simply takes off horizontally. So no vertical speed, but we'll be gaining a vertical speed at a negative 9.8 for four and a half seconds. And maybe that's in a bad spot there. You guys over here on the edge aren't going to be able to see the four and a half. But I'll take then the negative 9.8, multiply it by the 4.52, coming up to be 44.3 meters per second for the speed in the vertical direction. Uh, thank you, negative. Which again, negative being down, makes sense that the coyote is heading in a downward direction. And although the problem doesn't ask it, I'm going to do a D. Partly because I want you to see the conversion from Cartesian back to polar that I keep emphasizing. But also partly because I know you have a homework problem that has a question that has always, in the past anyways, give students a hard time and I want to help you with it. Uh, the one on your homework has to do with an airplane uh, dropping something. I think it's dropping a, a, a bomb on a target. This one, so let me illustrate it, I might ask this question for D What angle does the coyote hit the ground? Now, here's why that's important here. I'm going to draw that same picture, but a little smaller. If I take this, it looks like the motion looks something like this. We know this distance is 360. We know this height is 100. What angle does the coyote hit the ground? Will this work? We'll make a triangle. Can't you find the angle of that triangle? That won't work. Not that we can't find it, but that's not the angle that the coyote hits the ground. What angle does the coyote hit the ground? Isn't the movement of the coyote tangential to that plot? Right? It's the, that's the velocity vector, right? The velocity vector is tangential to it. 
Would you agree that the angle of that tangent vector is not the same as the angle of that triangle that's made there? And that's the common mistake that I see over and over again on this homework one. And so keep that in mind. It's not asking for the angle involved in that triangle. In fact, just for the fun of it, I guess I'll find that angle. But that is not the question I am asking. It could have been. Could have been. Look, if the coyote lands on the ground and wants to look back to where the coyote came from, at what angle would the coyote have to lift his eyes in order to see it? I mean, if that's the case, then it would be just simply the inverse tangent of the opposite, which is 100, over the adjacent, which is 360. And that gives me an angle of 15.5 degrees. But when I draw the velocity vector, I am drawing a different triangle. I am drawing a triangle that has horizontal and vertical components, not of distance, but of velocity. And so that's why part C can be quite useful here. The horizontal is 114. The vertical is 44.3. And I'll drop the negative here just so I can talk about the uh, magnitude of it. In fact, let me draw it a little better because this 144 is much longer than the 44.3 is tall. And so this is the velocity vector. How fast and at what angle? This would be the angle that I would want if the question was asking, at what angle does the coyote hit the ground? Could also ask what speed. I might as well do that one too. But that angle there would then be the inverse tangent of 44.3 over 114. Inverse tangent of 44.3 over 114. And that's a different angle. It's 21.2 degrees. And this is a really good example of one where you've got to be paying close attention to the meaning of, the, of each word and what, how it relates to the pictures. What angle does he hit the ground? Not angle, does he, what does he look back at? Those are two different questions, two different triangles, and two different angles. One triangle involving distance and one triangle involving velocity and velocity components. And, of course, maybe the fun thing to do is to find out the coyote's total speed. Uh, they didn't really ask for that in part C. They just asked for the components. But using Pythagorean's theorem, 144 squared, I mean 114 squared and 44.3 squared, add it together and take the square root, gives me then 122 meters per second. And so I think this problem would be a little better if it had a D in it. That's why I've done the part D. It doesn't really have it up there. But it also, I think, helps you on what you have to do, which is, like I said, one that students often have a little of a challenge with. Uh, shall we try more here? How about 52? And at some point, not to bore you, I hope these begin to look the same. Isn't it just the same thing over and over again? I mean, aren't you just describing the position and then you're going to put it into these equations? Yeah, sometimes we'll have constant acceleration. Probably most of the time we'll have constant acceleration. Other times we won't have constant acceleration. But isn't there just a horizontal motion and a vertical motion? And aren't you just going to do both of them at the same time? Yes, exactly. And when you begin to see that, that puts you in the position to realize that whatever shows up on the test, you could do. And the idea being some problem you've never seen before, you can do it if it's involving kinematics. And so that's why we give the general principles so that then you can solve any of the hundreds of thousands of problems that are 
are possible. And so even though we may be in class, only get a chance to talk about three or four or five of them, you can do any problem involving two-dimensional motion. All right, well, let's read this one here together. All right? 52 says, a truck is loaded with cannonball watermelons. Maybe I'll stop there. Cannonball watermelons aren't as common in our part of the country. We've got the bigger oblong ones. They don't roll really well. But these cannonball ones are very round. They're a little bit bigger than a uh, cantaloupe, so maybe I should just call them a cantaloupe here. But the point is, it's a, some fruit that can roll. Okay, because watch what's going to happen here. This cannonball watermelon stops suddenly to avoid running over the edge of a washed out bridge. So I don't know if you see it here, but that's the debris from the bridge. There's the road, there's the truck, there's the melons. Uh, that's the debris been washed out with the heavy rains, which actually getting somewhat of rain recently. In case you in case you guys forgotten what rain was in the last three years. It's, we got a little bit back, but we sure need a lot more here. All right, so the truck stops, causing a number of the melons to fly off the truck. And one melon rolls over the edge with an initial speed of 10 meters per second in the horizontal direction. Now, the cross section of the bank, okay, and so down here, the bank, where that, down here where this creek or this river was that flooded out and washed out the bridge. It says it is in the shape of the bottom half of a parabola with the vertex at the edge of the road and it's given by this equation y squared equals 16x. Uh, now I would encourage you to make sure you go back to your algebra. Let's read that algebra. We can either get ourselves tripped up here if we're not real careful what the author is telling us with those equations. And we'll see that in just a second. But here's the question. What are the x and y coordinates of where the melon then splats onto the bank? And so uh, that first step, I, I think you're getting the idea. Here is the road. Here is the riverbank. Here is this moving watermelon, uh, yeah, watermelon, 10 meters per second. Here it flies off the end. And lands down below somewhere, splat, right? What are the X and Y coordinates? Now, let's talk about the part that they gave us. They gave us y squared equals 16x. What shape is that? Is that a parabola? Because I thought this was a parabola. Okay, good. So, you guys are remembering your math and that, that's an important step here. What have they given me here? Uh, they did not give me the x being squared and the y to a, a first power, right? This kind of pattern gives you a parabola that is opened up. And if there's a negative in front, it's still a vertical parabola just opened down, right? Okay, what they have given me is one where essentially X and Y have changed roles here. And so that's a parabola on its side. Okay, so good. This must look something then like that. Which that kind of makes sense then because that's what they, they, they have here, right? But they've also done something very important that I hope you realize. Where's the origin? Yeah, well, this would be the vertex, and they say, right, that that vertex is also the edge of the road. But here's something I want to make sure you, you catch. You probably want to use this equation to solve it. Fair enough? So, we don't have a freedom of choice here, right? It's been chosen. 
and it has power over us. Really, our choice is this. Our choice is, do we want to use this equation to solve the problem? And I think so, and if the answer to that is yes, please keep in mind what else you have done. You have chose the origin to be the edge of the road. Now, to be quite honest, even if I was picking it, I probably would have picked that. So maybe I would get lucky there if I didn't realize that. But I want to keep pointing that out, that all of these numbers, all of these equations, you should be reading them, you should be studying, you should be interpreting them. They're telling you something, and sometimes it's telling you a lot more than students realize because they have forgotten to study it in, in great detail. And so they, they have told me to use that as the origin. Now, to be quite honest, when the ball gets launched, I probably would have picked that to be my origin. I would have asked you, where do you want to pick the origin? Where the ball lands or where the ball is launched? And like the last problem, I bet most of you would have said without question, let's pick where it gets launched from. And in this case, I would say we have to. We, if we want to use that equation, we have to pick that to be the origin. All right, so I'm going to put a, leave a circle around that because I do want to use that. And hence, that means that is my origin. And because of that, when I go to write down the equation for the motion of this watermelon, x and y, I would ask myself, again, is this a constant acceleration problem? Yes. So I can use these, and in fact, it is a, what we call a projectile problem. So what's the acceleration in the x direction? Zero. What's the acceleration in the y direction? Negative 9.8. Okay. So as I write this down, I would say zero is the position, the speed is 10, and the acceleration is zero. That's the equation for the x. In fact, I'll just simplify it right underneath. The equation for the y, y equals, and again, there's the zero, initial speed, there's the zero, negative one-half 9.8 t squared, right? That's applying that same equation, but for the vertical motion. The initial position is, is zero. The initial velocity is also zero. They made it very clear that this watermelon is moving only horizontally. It's not moving up and down. So its initial velocity in the y direction is zero. Now the x, it had 10, but in the y, it's zero. Again, that's our two-dimensional motion. We need to look at both of these equations at the same time. And then the acceleration is that negative 9.8. Let me simplify this equation in the next line by saying y equals a negative 4.9t squared. In fact, maybe I'll just put a circle around both of these. Because doesn't that mathematically describe then the movement of this watermelon? But how many unknowns are in these two equations? Two, three. There's three, right? There's the x and y coordinate of where it eventually goes splat and then the time. So I don't know x, I don't know y, I don't know time. Two equations, three unknowns, uh-oh. What am I going to do? Yeah, and I see some of you kind of eyeing back over here. Yeah, right? That's why that piece of information was important, and I need it. Because with that, I now have three equations with three unknowns. And that's a perfect math recipe to go ahead and, and solve it. But right here, I, I, I'm hopeless without that other piece of information. So had I not thought about the y dimension, I'm stuck. If I'm not thinking about the x dimension, I'm stuck. Or if I'm not using their equation for the bank, I'm stuck. I have to have all three equations. There's three unknowns. I don't know x, I don't know y, I don't know t. They don't even ask for all three. They ask for just x and y. So I don't even have to solve for time, although I probably will along the way. I, I don't know, it depends how the math works out, whether that will be an easier solution or not. Um, well, maybe I'll just do this. Maybe I will just take this one for time, which would be x over 10, and put it into this one. 
And so y equals negative 4.9. And in place of time, I will put an x squared over 100. Notice I, I squared both, right? And time squared. So I'll square the x and I'll square the 100. So those two equations now become 1. And of course, I've eliminated a variable. And that makes sense. So I have this equation. But I can combine it then with this equation. So let me solve this one for y. If I solve this one for y and substitute it into there, I have it, right? And so this is 4 times the square root of x. And so if I put that over to here, 4 times the square root of x equals a negative 4.9 x squared over 100. And again, that's our second substitution. Again, notice we've eliminated y. So now we have an equation only for x and we can solve for x, right? Are you guys going to let me keep going with my mistake? All right, I'll keep going. Let me square both sides. No, I shouldn't keep going. So what did I do wrong here? Uh, yep, square root. It's plus or minus. Right? And let's read it carefully. What does the plus tell me? The top half of the problem. What does the minus tell me? Bottom half. All right. So I really need a negative there. Right? I'm not paying close attention to my, my math. I can run into that problem. And actually, that is excellent what I wanted anyways, because I already had a negative on that side. And the negative on the other side means then when I take, take, start taking square roots, I won't be taking square root of a negative number. I mean, obviously, you already know. You tar start taking a square root of a negative number, you're in trouble. You did something wrong, right? And so something didn't work out. Which, by the way, that's a hint for this afternoon's lab. Um, there's an easy mistake to make along the lab. Students often do. And they have this negative number and then a square root. And they just go, <laughs> let's ignore the negative and let's keep going. Don't do that to yourself. It's, it's, it's not just, oh, the negative just can be ignored. There's a reason the negative is there. Go back and find it. Chances are the reason there is you made a mistake along the way is why the, the negative is there. So fix it. it. It is your chance to really correct yourself before you finish the whole problem and turn it in on a test and get a low score. It's like, oh my gosh, this, this, this can't happen. This makes no sense. So again, make sure you, you know, follow that along. All right, well, maybe I'll jump with the math over to here just because I know it's hard for some of you on the edges to, to see that one. Um, let's see, what do I have so far? Maybe I'll put all my numbers and all my variables uh, together here. Um, I've got a 4, and it looks like on the bottom, I have 100. Let's see, did I do that right? 4, and then 100, and then I can divide it by 4.9. And on the other side, oh, that's interesting. That's an x squared, and be okay if I write it as 3 house power? Because uh, this is actually x to a one-half power, right? So if I divide by a one-half power, it's three-halves power. Okay. Um, and in fact, maybe I'll just leave it at three-halves power for a second and see uh, what my calculator gives me here for x. So I got four times 100 divided by 4.9. That is an 81.6. And now let's get x, so let's raise everything to a two-thirds power. So there's my x. So 86 raised to a two-thirds power gives me 18.1. So 8, no, 18.8, excuse me, 81. So there is part of the answer. Where does it land? Where does it go splat? There's the x. And of course, once I know the x, I can come back over here and get the y. 
either here or get time here and put it here or I can get it here. In fact, maybe I'll just do this one there. So if I take the square root of that and then multiply that by the negative 4, I get y equals a negative 17.4 meters. And so there's where it goes splat. 18.8 over and 17.4 down. Fair enough? And I would say this is probably the harder of the problems we've done so far, but I'm also hoping that you see that these are looking a lot the same, right? We just have a position and accelerations and time and fit them all together. All right. Well, let's try another couple and then maybe we better move on to some circular motion. Looks like that'll have to roll into uh, Wednesday a little bit, but I think it'll be worth it. Uh, 55... The next one here I, I put on the list. Uh, let's read it together. Uh, maybe I should leave that on a board a little longer so you guys can write it down if you're not done. But 55 has some two-dimensional motion. It's got two objects in it. And so here it says a hawk is flying at 10 meters per second in a straight line, 200 meters above the ground. A mouse that it has been carrying struggles free. The hawk then continues on this path uh, with the same speed for two seconds before attempting to retrieve its prey. To accomplish this retrieval, it dies in a straight line at a constant speed and recaptures the mouse three meters above the ground. All right, well, I'm going to draw that picture before I get into the questions A, B, C, and I think maybe that's it, A, B, and C. But here's what I kind of got the description so far. That way up in the sky somewhere, 200 meters is a, oh no, a hawk. How do you make a hawk? A hawk is flying along straight line 200 meters above the ground a speed of 10 meters per second and I think they gave some time here what did they say 10 meters per second 200 meters the mouse has been carrying struggles free oh so at some point its prey Breakfast, if you will. I won't try to draw a mouse. I'll just a little dot there. All right. Struggles free. And, of course, begins to fall. Now, help me out here. What would be the path of this mouse? Yeah. So, it would keep at the same horizontal speed is what you're saying. And so, it would begin to fall. But also keep it same horizontal speed. So the hawk continues for about two seconds here. And so I'll put time equals two seconds before the hawk does anything. Which <coughs> sounds kind of odd. But I suppose it maybe if it's not that hungry, it's not going to worry about the, the food. But apparently, it gets free, continues on, but then decides it's going to retrieve it. <coughs> and so both of these, and a key step here is to realize that the mouse continues to move at two me or 10 meters per second as the hawk continues to move. So certainly from the hawk's perspective, the mouse is just dropping straight down. 
Uh, maybe you've seen war movies of that. You see the, you know, the World War II bombers flying along and they're dropping these gravity-fed bombs. And so from the pilot's point of view, they just kind of go straight down. It's why it's real important that the bomber's up really high because the bomb goes off underneath you. Or maybe you've seen some of the war movies where they have the little uh, drag chutes on the end of the bomblets. So as a bomb comes out, the parachute poof, slows them down and then they go behind the airplane. And so that's what you're going to need if you're low to the ground so that the bomb doesn't go off right underneath the, the airplane. If it's an atomic bomb, ooh, what do you do then? <laughs> you can't fly high enough. <laughs> yeah, turn around here. So you fly high enough that it's going to take a long time to hit the ground. So you launch it and then you turn around and hopefully you're going that way and the bomb's going that way. But the uh, World War II, Hiroshima, they, they didn't know what was going to happen. Those pilots were... They weren't sure if they were coming back or not. That was a risky mission to volunteer for. They just go, okay, well, we'll let it go, turn around and go as fast as we can, and hopefully that's far enough. See what happens. Anyway, so the mouse perspective is straight down. So again, but notice I'm going through and I'm thinking about it, and I'm reading them. Well, what, what, what really is this saying? And that will hopefully help you from getting trapped in a lot of unnecessary uh, you know, and wrong assumptions in your drawings. So in this case, though, the mouse continues to fall, and they say when it is a short distance, looks like three meters above the ground, the mouse is then intercepted by the hawk. And so the hawk goes straight for a while, then takes a dive at some angle, which I think is one of the questions they're going to ask, and then dives down at a constant speed in order to retrieve the mouse. So this path is the mouse. This path is the hawk. And, and I, think I, I think I got a good understanding then so far of the problem. All right? So now let's read it. Hey, assuming no air resistance acts on the mouse, Find the diving speed of the hawk. B. What angle did the hawk make with the horizontal during its descent? And then C. For how long did the mouse enjoy the free fall? Which, enjoy, I'm, it's probably a good thing they put it in quotes there. It would be a tough situation to be in if you're the mouse. Do I work myself free and fall to my death? Or do I stay here and get eaten to my death? Uh, yeah, your, kind of your choice there. So, this one. This one, actually, I think they're both going to die. I hate to say it. The problem, that, what, what do you think happens next? I mean, this hawk's got to be going pretty quick. It's 10 feet above the ground at a steep angle. I think the next thing is, bam. But uh, let's see what the numbers tell us here. But they, they don't describe what, what happens next here. So we're supposed to find those, those three questions here. What is going on here? And the first one is the diving speed of the, of the hawk. All right. So let's see. I guess I would put it into this category of saying let's look at the mouse for a moment. As I go to describe the motion of the mouse, I guess in the x direction would be what? Well, again, here we have that choice. Where do you want to call time equals to zero? Where do you want to call the origin? How do you want to lay this out? Well, they haven't given us any equations, so we still have that freedom of choice. It's not like the last problem. Okay, so again, the release point, call that the origin right there. All right, uh, fair enough. We've been doing that most of the time, and I guess I would continue with it. I'll even recommend it, as I said, in the, in the lab today. Again, what's nice about that is you know the initial position is zero. In this case, the initial horizontal speed is 10, and the acceleration in the x direction is, is zero. And so describing the motion of the mouse in the x direction, that would be our 
simple equation. So x is equal to 10t. The y direction is also a nice equation. Let's talk about it. Again, we know we have constant acceleration. They say it's in free fall, so we know the acceleration in the vertical is 9.8. And again, putting in these numbers, I would say the mouse starts at a position of zero. Um, it has a zero initial speed. Again, notice I get that from understanding the problem here. The problem is that right when the mouse works its way free, everything was moving horizontally. Nothing was going up or down. And so there's no vertical speed involved here. Um, the fact that it goes down, I'll put a negative 9.8. And so my equation in the vertical direction becomes a negative 4.9 t squared. And I have an x, a t, and a y, although this really isn't an unknown if we talk about the whole motion. Right, because don't we know the final place of the mouse? It's three meters above the ground. So I know that number, don't I? Is it three? No. What is this number? Yeah, negative is the important piece, and of course the magnitude is 197. So given our choice of how we set it up, Putting the origin up here, we know that the mouse has dropped down 197. Even though the way they described the problem was from measuring things above the ground. It's why on this problem it mm, could have been reasonable for, and I'm sure some of you were thinking, why don't you put the origin at the ground? And, and that's fine, you, you, you could have. It would have been different than the way we've done the other problems. But again, nothing wrong with that. We just got to realize that's going to be our our choice. Uh, but then we would have a starting point of 200 and a finishing point of 3. And it's nice to have zeros as much as possible in our equations. So I like that one. But again, notice the same thing that you're going to see here in the lab. Doesn't the vertical motion now become a clock? Keep that in mind as you're doing the problems. If you know the vertical beginning and ending point and you know I guess initial speed, the only thing you don't know is time and you can solve for time. And that's what this is going to do. That's the key to the lab today. Is you fire that ball and you're asked to calculate how far it lands. And the first thing you're going to do is write out the equation and go, I can't calculate how far it goes unless I know how much time it was in the air. And the key to the lab is going to be, ah, but I know how far it dropped down. And so you can write out the equation for the vertical motion, and you can know the vertical motion just like this mouse. And from that, you can get time. And so once you get time, you can come back and put that in the horizontal motion. So here I have two negatives, which I can cancel off. And then I get the 197 divided by the 4.9, which is a roughly a 40. Take the square root of 40, and it's 6.34 seconds. And maybe I'll even put a C here. I wasn't really trying to answer any of them yet. But that was that question C. How long did the mouse enjoy this free fall? But it's what I wanted to illustrate. Use the vertical motion for a clock. I've showed you a couple of times, but it's something that if you don't see, you get stuck on these problems right away which is why we do it in the lab and kind of make you run through it. And that's why I show you many examples here. You see, once I know then this, horror, this time, I can come back up here and say, how far did the mouse go horizontally? And it looks like it's 63.4 meters horizontally. Now, I don't think they asked that question, so that's not going to help me with A or B. I'm trying to cut the diving speed, but I do think I need to know that number to figure out something about the hawk, so I'm going to put it back up here, okay? And so now, just studying the mouse, I know where this point is and this point is. Uh, that's very helpful, because if I look a little closer at this, I'll even draw a triangle where the hawk 
dives down. This is that 197, right? And didn't we just say then this whole distance is the 63.4. Now that can be helpful because remember the hawk kept flying for two seconds at 10 meters per second. So isn't that part of the motion 20? Huh? 6.34, what? Oh, I'm sorry, the distance. Uh, the distance. Yeah, the distance is 63.4. Yeah, and the time is 6.34 seconds, yes. Yeah, and right now I'm looking at distance. So the distance down is 197 meters. The distance total over is 63, but this distance right here, because it's two seconds, is 20 meters. Doesn't that mean this right here is 43.4 meters? And if you know two sides of a right triangle, don't you know everything about the triangle, including the other angles in the high, in this case the hypotenuse or the third side? Yes. And so I should be able to get that angle right there. Which I think is question B or A, one of the two was what angle? Yeah, B. What angle did the hawk make with its dive here? So I would say the tangent of theta, so here's B, would be 197. And again, I'll just use absolute values here. I'm doing a, a right triangle, so it's an angle down. And then the horizontal distance is the 43.4 meters. And so grabbing my calculator, I can say inverse tangent of 197 divided by 43.4, coming up with about a 77.6 degree dive. So it's a steep dive. Not quite straight down, but pretty close. And all the more reason I say, this is kaboom at the end here, right? And then, of course, I think I also have enough information by this point to answer C, which was to find the speed. Oh, no, A, sorry. Um, find the speed. So C, we, we kind of did this in reverse order. But it looked like those were the easy ones to do in that order, so I... I just actually didn't even think about C. I just got lucky. I was just calculating and found C right away. Which then let me think about B. Which then also lets me think about A because to get A, I know that it's a constant speed. So let's just do the old 102 notation. Distance traveled divided by time taken. Uh, I guess for our class, we would call that, you know, the average speed, but in this case the average speed and the instantaneous speed are one and the same. I'm not taking a derivative here, I'm just saying look, it's, Hawk is going at some constant speed, so just take that total distance. And the total distance I can get from Pythagorean's theorem. We just said it was 43.4 meters horizontally and 197 meters vertically. You add that up and that added in quadrature, or using Pythagorean's theorem, that's going to be the distance that the hawk traveled to get down to the mouse, and then the time it took during that dive, as we already said, would be two seconds shy of this one. This is the whole fall of the, of the mouse, but the hawk did not actually start moving for two seconds later, so this has to be a 4.34 seconds. And this problem, maybe more than any of the other ones, really illustrate, make sure you're reading the numbers. What, what does each number mean here? Because we've got a bunch of different times here. We've got the total time, and then we've got the two seconds before the hawk starts to move. Then we've got the rest of the time, which is that 4.34 uh, seconds here. So as far as the distance goes, it's 43.4 squared added to 197 squared. And take the square root of all of that. Gives me about 202 meters in a time of 4.34 seconds, meaning that hawk traveling at 46.5 meters per second, which out of curiosity, 
Converting to miles per hour is just a hair over 100 miles an hour. So we've got a bird traveling over 100 miles an hour, 10 feet off the ground, straight headed towards the ground. All the more reason I think the end of the story is they, they both hit the ground. <laughs> so poor, uh, poor choice. I think in reality, I, I have actually seen this in action, the hawks let them work their way free, let them fall. And then pick them up after they bounce off the ground. That's the best thing for the hawk to do. Just let the snake, or in my case, it was an alligator lizard, and you watch it come down and it <coughs> off the street. And it wasn't a hawk, it was a crow, but so the crow was flying up above and flying around. Although the best part of the story was my neighbor who uh, saw the whole thing in action. And the crow was overhead, and the other crows were. Uh, nearby and had one of those, you know the alligator lizard, not the little friendly blue billy lizards ones, the ones that are fun to put on your shoulder, but the one snappy ones. So I had one of those that I'm sure would have been breakfast or lunch, whatever time of the day it was, and it fell and fell right in the center of the street. And uh, my neighbor, old gentleman, he, he thought this would be cool to pick up the lizard and show my, my kids young at the time. So he grabs the lizard and he brings it over and the lizard wasn't dead, just kind of knocked out. By the time he gets to my kids, it kind of comes through and just takes a chunk out of his forefinger and just rips it off. And so as he's showing my little four-year-old, the blood's coming out of his head. Oh, look at his friendly lizard. <laughs> just took a bite out of him. So scared my kids to death. They'll never be the same after that. <laughs> So, there's another one. Oh good, how are we doing on time? There was a, a one more then in our, kind of our projectile motion I wanted to do here. And then we'll get to some circular motion and it looks like we'll just maybe have to wait till, till Wednesday on that. It'll cut in a little bit to our chapter five. But I, but I think it's time worth, uh, worth taking here to deal with this. We just need to add a little more ink here to my pen. And say, so, all right, let's look at 59 here. Same idea as all the other ones, I hope. And so I hope by this time you're like, yeah, 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 this is the same one. Let's move on to something else, which we will. This is the last one. It says here that a skier leaves the ramp of a ski jump with a velocity of 10 meters per second and an angle of 15 degrees above the horizontal as shown. The slope of the incline is 50 degrees and the air resistance is negligible. Find A, the distance from the ramp to where the jumper lands. And so if you've seen this sporting event, you know, they land on this heavy sloped ramp and of course the idea is to see who can jump the, the farthest and, you know, the gold medal for all of us who just enjoy our winter sports here in Santa Barbara and, yeah, and uh, but anyways here's our here's our skiing here and it says here the distance from the ramp to where the jumper lands and then B the velocity components just before landing and then there's some other questions about that but let me get started with at least that much and I'll start again by drawing a picture but you can see this is a lot like the other ones. It's a projectile motion. We've got things moving through the air. The only thing different is they started a little different than, say, the watermelon one. The watermelon one, the uh, watermelon went straight off the edge. And instead of landing on a ramp, it landed on a curve. But really, other than that, I, I hope you see it's really the, the same problem. And so we have in number... 59, the skier coming down, gaining some speed, and then it launches. Let me put a dotted line to make horizontal, because one thing that I think that makes the math at least a little more complicated, the logic's still the same, is that this initial speed has both X and Y components and that's something we haven't had in any of our other problems so far. But other than that, it is identical in the logic. And so here is the slope that it lands on. What do they call this? The landing ramp or something? The skier leaves the, the ramp 
Okay, so the jump is the ramp. Um, the slope of the incline. I guess they don't call it a, a landing ramp. Probably not to confuse it with the ski jumping ramp. All right, so, but the slope. So the sloping part of it is 50 degrees. So down here, actually, where do they put the 50 degrees? They put it down to the bottom? Yeah. So here is the 50 degrees. And so the skier is going to look something like this. It's going to go up and land maybe right about there. Okay. And so there's our, our motion. But again, like all of these, keep separately X and Y. That was the whole point of our discussion as we worked out the I components and the J components. We haven't even been really using, did you notice that throughout these problems? The I and J components in our equation. We use them to come up with these equations separately and then we haven't even been really using them in the equations. I've just kind of been making two charts. And so that's how I'd encourage you at the, at the beginning. I'm not even going to worry about the trying to do both motions in one equation. I'll just make two separate ones. And that's why I kept saying to do two-dimensional motion, we just do one-dimensional motion twice. So as I write out the motion of the skier, I'll start off with the same question as we said before. Where do you want to put the origin of this problem? <laughs> yeah. And I hear a bunch of you saying, yeah, let's put it at the launch point. Good. We've done every one like that, and we're going to do that in the lab in a, about an hour from now, or at least a third of you in an hour, and the rest of you throughout the day. But there is the equation here for the x direction, or my, well, it's going to be the equation, because I'm going to put then the starting position as zero. And then I will have the initial velocity in the x direction. And that's where the 10 cosine of 15 degrees comes into to play. And so just like that cannonball one, uh, the watermelon, the cannonball watermelon one, we had an initial horizontal speed, but that was easy because it was all horizontal, it was all 10. Now we got to get the component of it. And that's why, again, we, you just did the chapter 3 and you just turned in the homework on it. So, again, right now I would just write down this first part of the equation. In fact, I'm going to just even get out my calculator and put in what is 10 times the cosine of 15 in 9.66. So 9.66t would be my first equation. This is the equation giving me the horizontal position based upon time. Now if you're good with that, let's go to the y motion. So in the y motion, same thing. y equals, and again, the nice thing about putting the origin at that launch point is that first one is zero. But this one is not zero. A lot of the problems we've been doing, the horizontal initial velocity, I mean the vertical initial velocity has been zero. And that's, that's not the case here. And so I'll put a zero for the position, but for the velocity, it's 10 sine 15. Right? It's opposite of the angle of 15 degrees. And then it is a time and then the acceleration is a negative 9.8. So notice as you're setting this up, or at least as I'm setting it up, notice that the initial speed is a positive number, meaning it's going up. Whereas that very first problem we did with the window, the ball tossed out the window, the initial speed was negative. Right? And that's the difference here. Of course, the acceleration is still down, so that one's a negative. So we've got a positive for that term and a negative for, for that term. And then if I simplify this equation, what is 10 times the sine of 15? That's about a 2.59t and minus 4.8t squared. And I'll put a little box around that. Again, let me say it one more time before we go off into lab. Notice that the vertical motion could be used as a clock. This time not quite 
because I don't know where it lands on the vertical. But if I knew where it landed on the vertical, I could put that number in, solve for time. Once I have time, I can put it in here and get, get x. And so some equations, you know, or some problems are set up that they give you the full information of the vertical motion, like that mouse one and the hawk. They gave us enough vertical motion that we can get time, and then from time we can get how far horizontally. This one we can't solve for the time because we don't know where the skier lands. In fact, let's pause and look at this one. Doesn't this one look a lot like the watermelon one? How many unknowns do I have up here? Two. Oh, three. It's three, right? X, Y, and T, right? I, I, those are the three uh, variables I don't know. How many equations am I going to need to solve that? Three, right? Yeah. And I have two. What am I missing? Yeah, definitely a third equation. Which one? Right, an equation for that landing ramp, the slope. Now, when we did the watermelon one, they gave it to us. So I'd say the watermelon one was maybe a little bit easier. Here, you need to realize that you need a third equation and that you need to come up with it. All right, because what I know is this equation is essentially the equation that would give me the parametric plot that would show this parabola and I would really want to know where those two cross that line, right? And so that's why I need an equation for that line before I can finish here. Alright, so let's talk about that. Fortunately it's a line. Because again, going back to my algebra, don't you know the equation for a line? Right? This is what you learn, and I think you probably call it the slope-intercept form. Right? M is the slope, and B is the, the intercept. All right. Well, maybe I will start with the intercept. What's the intercept of this? Yeah, it goes right through the origin. There. That was another nice thing about setting that up as the origin. B is zero. Didn't see that coming, but that was good. How about the slope? And I think it's this step here why your author made it a magenta problem. He said, look, you got to come up with that 30. You got to realize you need a third equation on your own. You got to come up with it. And it's the equation for that ramp. So you need to realize you need a third one. You need to know what it's supposed to represent, the equation for that ramp. And now you need to find that equation. And that's what I'm trying to do, find it. What would be slope? What was slope? Rise over run. Does that help yet? No? Let's mix our algebra with our trig. What's tangent of an angle? Opposite over adjacent, right? Here I have an angle, 50 degrees. Wouldn't that be opposite over adjacent? Isn't the opposite the rise? Isn't the adjacent the run? If I put those two together, doesn't that tell me slope is tangent of theta? So for this case, slope and tangent of the angle are exactly the same. And again, I think it's why your author put that as a magenta. So what this actually would be is the slope would be tangent of 50 degrees times x, right? Well, what's the tangent of 50 degrees? Tangent 50, 1.19. Y equals 1.19x. You going to let me continue with my mistake? Negative slope, isn't it? Okay. So again, making sure we're reading the math as well as doing the math. We know the slope is rise over run. We also know tangent is opposite over adjacent. We can put those two together. But we do need to be careful here as we look back to our algebra. This has a negative 
slope. So that would be the correct formula. So again, I'm sure he put magenta here because number one, you need to realize you need a third equation. You need to represent, you need to realize what that equation represents and that would be the slope there of that landing ramp. And now you need to come up with that equation. And so I've just done that. Now I think it becomes real easy. Now it's just a math problem, three equations and three unknowns. And we begin to solve it just like we did be, before here. Maybe the first thing for me to do is to put T into there. So if I do that, I get Y equals 2.59. And in place of T, I will put X over 9.66 minus 4.9, and in place of t, I will put x squared over 9.66 squared. That's kind of nice right there. And so maybe I'll put in the diagram here, how are we doing on time? We got enough time to finish this? Oh, good. Then this is combining those two equations. And then the third one is to take that one and substitute it into here. So this says negative 1.19x equals 2.59x over 9.66 minus 4.9 over 9.66 squared x squared. And so if I put some numbers into my calculator, 2.59 divided by 9.66 comes up with a 0.268x. This is 4.9 divided by 9.66 squared. So minus 0.0525x squared negative 1.19x. Keep going with the algebra. I'm going to move this so I just have a positive number, 0.525x squared there. Over here, if I move that over to there, I can really add those two together. 1.19 plus 0.268 coming up with 1.458x. Obviously, one solution is x equals to zero. <coughs> well, of course that's a solution. Does they cross that x equal to zero? Yeah, yeah that's where they took, took the, uh, the skier took off from. So, not a surprise, it's a solution. Not the one I'm interested in. So, let's then divide both sides by an x that does not equal to zero. And then I can get 1.458 divided by 0 0.0525 coming up with x being 27.8 meters. Which once I have x, I can get y. Because if I take that x and I multiply it by a negative 1.19 according to this equation, I get a negative 33 zero meters. And I could also get time, but since we are out of time, I won't. What does it say here? Oh, find the distance down the ramp. So we're out of time, but I still need to do Pythagorean's theorem, don't I? To get this. All I've got is the x and the y. So using Pythagorean's theorem, I can figure out how much distance it would have to go down to there. Well, I hope those help. We didn't do any circular ones. 